Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Cabinet of Curiosities on Our Own Devices. I'm Jean Messi, and quite a few episodes ago, I covered a variety of Canadian military radiation detection and monitoring equipment, or RADIAC equipment, from the Cold War period. And I thought it might be interesting today to have a look at some of the civilian equivalents to this equipment. Uh, these devices right here are associated with civil defense agencies, which, as I've covered in previous videos, were organizations intended to prepare the civilian populace for and protect them in the wake of a nuclear attack. And they did this in a variety of ways, for example, by creating and issuing pamphlets and other literature on radiological hazards, what to do in the wake of a nuclear attack, how to dig your own basement fallout shelter, etc., by building and maintaining communal fallout shelters, and by providing training on rescue and first aid. And as part of these programs, they maintained and issued a variety of radiation monitoring equipment just like this one. Uh, they would either use these to stock communal fallout shelters, they would issue big kits to high schools and colleges in order to train people on how to detect and monitor radiation. And also some of these devices were available on the open market for people to purchase to stock their own home fallout shelters. So let's come in a little bit closer and have a look at these things one at a time. So the first item we're going to look at today is called a CDV15 gamma survey meter. Now, most of the radiation detection equipment that was issued during the Cold War, both in civilian and military circles, was exclusively for the detection of gamma rays. Now, as most of you know, the three basic types of radiation emitted by radioactive materials are alpha particles, which are helium nuclei, two protons, two neutrons, beta particles, which are essentially electrons, and gamma rays, which are a form of electromagnetic radiation similar to X-rays. So under normal circumstances, alpha and beta radiation isn't all that dangerous, provided that the isotopes emitting them are kept outside of the human body. Uh, alpha particles really can't even penetrate the skin, and beta particles can be blocked by a fairly thin sheet of metal. If they do manage to get inside the body, though, that's where you really get into trouble, because especially alpha particles deposit a large amount of energy, and if they get into the tissue, they can deposit that energy directly into the cells, causing massive tissue damage, and more importantly, genetic damage, which can lead to the development of cancer. So you're probably familiar with the story of the radium girls who were hired in the early 20th century to paint radium illuminating paint on watch and clock dials. And they would sharpen the paintbrushes with their tongues and absorb large amounts of radium, which the body mistook for calcium and deposit directly into the bones. And then that radium would deposit its energy directly into the bones, causing tissue necrosis and something called radium jaw, where the jaw would just dissolve and fall out. Rather nasty. So what this means is that the radiation protective clothing that we're familiar with, what is typically known in the military as NBCW, a Nuclear Biological Chemical Warfare, or CBRN, Chemical, Biological, Radiological, and Nuclear Protective Equipment, basically an airtight suit with a gas mask, doesn't work the way you probably think it does. It's not actually meant to block radiation coming from the outside. Rather, it is meant to stop your body from becoming contaminated with fallout, so dust or smoke or water that's become contaminated with radionuclides. It stops you from breathing it in, getting it on your skin, or ingesting it. Uh, and that, in normal circumstances, is enough to protect you from those types of radiation. However, it cannot block gamma radiation, which is very penetrating and can only be shielded against using very thick shielding, so lead, concrete, and steel. So it's actually impossible to make a practical mobile suit that will block gamma radiation. So in a nuclear warfare situation, it's very important to know the dose rate of the gamma radiation in the environment around you so you can protect from it and avoid those areas. And that's what these meters were intended for. So during the early Cold War period, the American Office of Civil Defense, or OCD, adopted, standardized, and issued a wide variety of radiation detection instruments. One of the earliest, first issued in 1954, being the CDV-710, also known by its manufacturer's designation, the L-Electronics SID-1. And this is both issued by civilian agencies, 
and also sold on the commercial market by Sears Roebuck as the Radtech. So you could actually go to Sears and pick up your own gamma survey meter to stock up your home fallout shelter. There's also the CDV720, which was produced by Chatham Electronics, both in civilian variants and for the military, where it was known as the IM123PD. And what's interesting about this device is that it had the capability to detect both beta particles and gamma rays. And so to detect beta particles, you would slide away a little metal shield to reveal a window that was transparent to beta particles and allowed them into the detection element. If you only wanted to detect gamma rays, then you would slide the shield shut and the shield would block out the beta particles and only allow gamma radiation to enter the detection element. And then in 1962, the OCD adopted the Model 715, which superseded both the 7110 and the 720. And the prototype versions of the 715 had the same beta window with the sliding shield as the 720, but this never made it past the prototype stage, and all of the manufactured versions have this squared off front of the case, and the case is completely closed off, meaning that it can only detect gamma radiation. Now, these originated with the Victorine Instrument Company in Ohio, but they were also manufactured by a variety of other companies, including Lionel Electronics Laboratory. And if that name sounds familiar, this was actually a division of the Lionel Company that produced the famous toy trains. In 1960, they acquired a firm called Anton Electronics in an attempt to diversify their product line, and they entered the radiation instrument market. And they produced a handful of interesting instruments. Probably their best seller was the CDV700, which was a regular Geiger Muller tube based radiation detector. And between 1955 and 1985, they sold 450,000 of these to the OCD. They also produced an upgraded variant of the 715 called the Model 1 1A, which uh, supplied higher voltage to the detection element to increase its accuracy and its reliability. And they also produced a very strange prototype for a battery-powered portable radio combined with a Geiger counter. And this is supposed to be the ultimate piece of home fallout shelter equipment, allowing you to listen to government broadcasts in the wake of a nuclear war and check your fallout shelter for radiation. But that never made it past the prototype stage either, and they were never manufactured or sold. So the model that I have here was manufactured by yet another company, Landers, Frary and Clark of New Britain, Connecticut. And when I acquired it, I was lucky enough to also get the original box, which contained not only the unit itself, but also this shoulder strap, which connects to these two loops in the front and the back to allow you to more easily carry it without dropping it. Unfortunately, though, the manual that would have come in this box is missing. So let's have a closer look at this and see how it actually works. So I can actually take this apart by undoing these two clasps at the front and the back and lifting the interior out and we can see the detection element inside. So these types of instruments work on the principle of the ionization chamber. So if I were to cut this cylinder here apart, you would see that there is an inner shell made out of graphite that acts as the cathode. And then there is an anode in the form of a little circular metal plate suspended on insulating posts. And this is filled with air at ambient pressure, although the whole unit is sealed, and a large voltage is applied across those two electrodes. And what happens is when ionizing radiation, gamma radiation, goes through the chamber, it ionizes the gas. It knocks electrons off gas particles. And this creates ion pairs, a cation and an anion, which are then drawn to the opposite charges on the cathode and the anode. And this constant production and flow of these ion pairs creates an ion current. And that is what this device detects and displays on the dial. Now, this is similar to, but distinct from, the standard radiation detection device that we're used to, which is a Geiger-Muller tube. So a Geiger-Muller tube consists of a very similar setup, two concentric electrodes across which a high voltage is applied. 
However, when a radiation detection event occurs and an ion pair is produced, when those ions start moving towards their respective electrodes, they will be accelerated to such a high energy that they themselves start to ionize gas particles along their path. And this leads to a cascade effect known as a Townsend avalanche. And this causes a big pulse of amplified current, which is the characteristic crackling or popping sound you hear in a traditional Geiger counter. And in order to get your overall count rate, your counts per minute, the Geiger counter has to have an integrating circuit to add up all those counts. Ion chamber based detectors, on the other hand, only detect the overall effects of radiation flux going through the chamber, that ion current that I was talking about. But sometimes you'll have a gamma survey meter that produces the same characteristic crackling or popping as an ordinary Geiger counter that is artificially produced as an aid for an operator who might be more familiar with using a Geiger counter to allow them to find sources of radiation. So looking at the top surface here, we can see our display and our controls. We have our dial here, which goes from zero to five Röntgens per hour dose rate, as well as a little zone here for checking the charge on the battery. We have our settings dial here, which has seven positions off, Circuit check, which allows you to check the battery charge. Zero, which allows you to set the needle back against zero using this little dial right here to calibrate it. And then four different sensitivity settings. So times 100, times 10, times one, and times 0.1. So the higher the dose rate that you're measuring, uh, the least sensitive you want it. Otherwise it'll just jump plumb off the scale and you won't actually be able to measure anything. And then we have our data plate right here, as you can see, OCD item number CDV715, model number 1A, Landers Fair and Clark, New Britain, Connecticut, the manufacturer, and then our serial number. So really not much going on, very simple device. But there is one interesting marking here, which is this big stamped R on the cover. So in the early 1960s, when the V715 was first issued, the California Disaster Office and Oak Ridge National Laboratory in Tennessee conducted extensive field trials of this model, and they found that the units, as issued, left a lot to be desired. They suffered from battery drain in high humidity, calibration shifts, circuit check failures. Uh, they had a lot of problems. And so in 1971, they underwent a retrofit program in which they did things like replace the resistors, which were found to be hygroscopic. They absorb moisture from the atmosphere with more water-resistant glass ones. And they also ruggedized the dial, which was found to be rather fragile. And so all of the units that underwent this retrofit program were stamped with R for retrofit. And also the ruggedization of the dial involved putting in this black plastic ring. So these units are very easily identifiable. So another problem commonly encountered with this model was that due to the pressure inside the ion chamber being kept at ambient, moisture from the atmosphere tended to leak inside, reducing reliability. Thankfully, the fix for this was rather simple. They would pull out the ion chamber, drill a hole in it, heat it up to expel all the moisture, and then solder the hole shut. Although this doesn't appear to have been done to this particular unit. So that is the CD715 gamma survey meter very typical of instruments of its type from the early Cold War period. So now let's move on to an even more interesting device. So when it comes to radiation protection, it's not enough to just know how much radiation that your environment is emitting. You also need to know how much radiation you yourself have cumulatively been exposed to. And to do this, you use a device called a dosimeter. Now the simplest and one of the most common types of dosimeters is called a film badge dosimeter. And just as the name implies, this consists of a piece of photographic film inside a special holder that is worn on a person's body. And they go through their day, say if they're working at a nuclear power plant or in a medical imaging ward or something like that, where you might be exposed to a lot of radiation. Then at the end of the monitoring period, the film is removed and developed and the degree to which it has fog, that is to which the radiation has exposed the emulsion, gives the cumulative dose. Now, depending on the type of radiation a person is likely to be exposed to, the badge may be made out of different materials. For example, if they're going to be exposed to things like beta particles, then the badge will be made out of plastic or some other material that's transparent to those particles to allow them to reach the film. 
Whereas if they only want to monitor, say, exposure to gamma rays or X-rays, then the badge will be made out of metal to block out all other types of radiation, but allow this high energy electromagnetic radiation in. So although photographic emulsion has been used to detect radiation for over a century, in fact, it was the accidental exposure of a photographic plate by uranium salts that led Henri Becquerel to discover radioactivity in 1896, the formal use of film badges for radiation monitoring wasn't established until the Manhattan Project in the 1940s by physicist Ernest Wollen. So another type of decimeter in common use at this time is the so-called pencil or quartz fiber decimeter invented by Charles Lauritsen in 1937, and that is what we are looking at here. So how this works is that in one end of the decimeter, you have an ionization chamber with a thin fiber of quartz coated in gold. And on the other, you have a simple microscope with a reticle etched with a scale showing your cumulative radiation dose. And if you hold this up to a light, you'll be able to see that scale with a little line falling across it, which is the quartz fiber. So in order to use this, you first need to charge it and you use a charger like this one. So to use this, you unscrew this cap, which is held to the unit with a little ball chain, and then you push the decimeter down with the dial here set on charge. And this is going to apply a around 200 volt charge to the quartz fiber, which is gonna make it stand on end, which is the same as say rubbing a balloon on your hair or putting your hands on a Van de Graaff generator. The static charge makes your hair stand on end. And that's going to push that fiber back to the zero on the scale. And then you put this in your pocket and carry it around while you're working in your radiation environment. Now how this works is that as radiation goes through the chamber, it produces, just like in the ion chamber on the gamma survey meter that we just looked at, ion pairs. But these ion pairs then combine with the opposite charge of ions on the actual quartz fiber. And so it will actually leach charge, leach electrons away from the quartz fiber. And as it leaches its charge, it will start to curl back to its original position. This causes it to move across the scale. So the farther it curls, the farther it moves across the scale, the more radiation that this, and by extension you, have been exposed to. And you can read your cumulative dose at any time by just holding this up to the light and reading the position of the fiber on the scale. Uh, if you happen to be in a low light environment, say you're on the nuclear battlefield at night or you're in a fallout shelter that doesn't have great lighting, this charger actually comes with a built-in light. So if you actually push this down into the charging station, a little light bulb will turn on inside, allowing you to read the decimeter. And then you just turn this to charge, it resets it, and you're ready to go. And you can use this as many times as you want. And it's very handy because you can continuously monitor your dose. You don't actually need to send it in like a film badge decimeter uh, in order for it to be processed and read to you later. So this style of decimeter and charger was manufactured by a wide variety of companies, including Victorine, Bendix, Landsverk, Universal Atomics, and Jordan Electronics. And there were a number of different models manufactured that had a different range of radiation exposure. So for example, there was the CDV138, which could only read between 0 to 200 milliroentgens. This was intended for training using a fairly low level radioactive source. There was the V730, which had a range of 0 to 20 Röntgen, the V740, 0 to 100 Röntgen, and the V742, 0 to 200 Röntgen. And this was one of the most common models, and around 3 million of those were produced during the Cold War. And in the Canadian and American militaries, those were given the designation IM5502A, which I had a brief look at in my Radiac Equipment video. So certain companies actually made plastic versions of these decimeters because they were easier to mass produce, although unfortunately they found that yellow paint, which is typically used to designate civil defense equipment, didn't stick well to the plastics. So these had to be issued in their original black color. Certain companies also made aluminum barreled versions, which they gold anodized to approximate civil defense yellow. As for the decimeter charger, this is what would be known as a CDV750 in civilian use and IM5120 in military service. 
and this uses a battery to impart charge on the dissimeter, but there were versions that used a piezoelectric circuit, sort of like a barbecue igniter where you compress a quartz crystal to produce an electric charge. And one of the more interesting versions of this was the V750 Mod 6, which was issued a lot later in the 1980s. And this was shaped like a pistol. You would place the dissimeter inside of it and squeeze the handle to activate the piezoelectric mechanism and impart a charge to the dissimeter. And this particular model is a Bendix 608, which as we have seen has a scale that goes from 0 to 10 Röntgen. Now, over the years, a variety of other dissimeter types have been developed. During the Manhattan Project, a very common one was what was known as a pocket ion chamber. And this was vaguely similar to a quartz fiber dissimeter, only it didn't actually use a moving fiber. Rather, it had an insulated fiber that was fixed in the middle that would be charged and then would bleed off its charge as it was exposed to radiation. And you couldn't read it directly, you had to take it to a special instrument that would measure the charge and give you your accumulated dose. This was less convenient, but it was also considered to be more reliable and more sensitive. There's also a type of dissimeter based on the fluorescence of a special type of glass, and I've actually done an extensive overview, including a demonstration of how the reading device works on one of those in my video on military radiac equipment. So please check that out, link in the description. There have also been dissimeters based on Geiger counter tubes, where it detects radiation just like a Geiger counter does, but then has a circuit that integrates the results into a cumulative dose. And today, dissimeters are typically solid-state devices based on MOSFET technology that continuously detect radiation and display your cumulative dose on little LCD screens. So the technology has come a long way. So at this point, you're probably wondering, what does all of this mean? What is a Röntgen? How do you measure radiation dose? And how high a dose is too high? And unfortunately, the answer here is it's complicated. So the Röntgen was the first attempt to create a standard unit of radiation exposure. It was named after Wilhelm Röntgen, the discoverer of x-rays, and was defined in 1928 as the amount of x-rays it would take to impart one coulomb of electrostatic charge in one kilogram of dry air. And while this is a fine unit for scientific purposes, uh, in medical applications, this really ignored the fact that radiation has different effects on different materials, such as human tissue. So in 1947, a different unit was created called the Röntgen Equivalent Man, or the REM. And this was defined as the energy deposited per unit weight of tissue that was equivalent to the effects of one Röntgen of x-rays. And this was measured at around 95 ergs per gram. This was later rationalized in 1953 as the RAD, which was defined as 100 ergs per gram of tissue. And then in 1975, this was metricated to the gray, which is defined as one joule per kilogram of tissue or 100 RADs. But while this was a step in the right direction, this didn't take into account the actual effects of radiation on the human body. So another unit had to be developed called the sievert. And this is measured in the same units as the gray, joules per kilogram, but is modified using conversion factors to account for the type of radiation and the type of tissue being affected. X-rays, gamma rays, and beta particles, which are typically used to calibrate these units, have a weighing factor of one. Neutrons have a weighing factor based on a number of complex formulas that are dependent on the energy of the neutrons themselves. Protons, which can deposit a lot more energy per unit than other types of radiation, have a weighing factor of 2, whereas alpha particles have a weighing factor of a whopping 20. And this is why alpha particles are so dangerous when they're inside the human body. They can deposit a lot of energy at the same time, creating massive tissue and genetic damage. Now, in addition to different types of radiation having different effects on the body, different tissues have different sensitivities to radiation. So the general rule here is that the faster dividing the tissue, the more sensitive it is. This is because during the division process, all the DNA in a cell comes together into dense chromosomes, which are sensitive to damage by incoming radiation. And so the most sensitive types of tissue are the bone marrow, the stomach, and the colon, with a weighing factor of 0.12. 
This is why one of the most common cancers produced by exposure to radiation is leukemia, because it damages the cells of the bone marrow and causes the production of abnormal white cells. This is also why one of the first symptoms of acute radiation poisoning is nausea and vomiting, because the cells of the stomach, which have to divide rapidly to avoid being dissolved through by the stomach acid, are immediately affected, causing a violent reaction. Moving down, the gonads have a tissue weighing factor of 0.08, still very sensitive, and this is why radiation exposure runs the risk of creating birth defects if the gametes are damaged. Then finally, at the other end of the scale, we have the brain, which has a tissue weighing factor of only 0.01. The brain, which doesn't have a lot of division going on in it, is actually relatively insensitive to radiation. So if you're worried about your brain getting fried when you're getting a dental x-ray, don't worry. The brain is actually very insensitive and the dose is very small anyway. So to give you an idea of what the sievert actually means in practical terms, 98 nanosieverts is the amusingly named banana equivalent dose, which is the equivalent radiation dose you get from eating a single banana, which contains the radioactive isotope potassium-40. 5 to 10 microsieverts is the equivalent of one dental x-ray. 1.5 to 1.7 millisieverts is the annual dose accumulated by your average flight attendant. One sievert is the maximum total dose that can be absorbed by a NASA astronaut over their career. Now, above one sievert is where you really start getting into serious health effects, especially if this entire dose is absorbed at once. So, for example, four to five sieverts is the LD50 for most radiation. This is the lethal dose 50%, or the dose that will kill 50% of people within 30 days. And finally, at the other end of the scale, we have 64 sieverts, which is the highest radiation dose survived by a human being. And this is the dose absorbed over a period of 21 years by one Albert Stevens, who was injected with plutonium as part of a top-secret government project. And to learn more about that horrifying project, please check out the video that I wrote on the subject over on Today I Found Out. Yet despite all these units being systematized, the biological effects of radiation still remain fairly poorly understood and unpredictable. And this is because radiation exposure is what's known as a stochastic process, meaning that it isn't deterministic, it's highly probabilistic. You cannot say that a certain amount of radiation exposure will have X effects in a certain person. Although you can average over a large population and say that on average, this amount of radiation tends to have this effect, but it does vary from person to person. Somebody can be exposed to a large amount of radiation, like Albert Stevens, over a lifetime and suffer no ill effects, where somebody else can be exposed to a very small amount of radiation and develop terminal cancer. It's not all that predictable. Anyway, that's all I have for you today. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you next time on another episode of Cabinet of Curiosities, where we'll look at yet more fascinating devices, and I guarantee you, more radiological equipment just like this. Until then, I'm Jean Messi from Our Own Devices. Have a great day.